think of seeing a set of random footprints in the snow. From that, you could reasonably deduce that someone had recently walked there. You wouldn't know anything about that person, who they are, what their life is like, or who they love. You would only know that someone walked there. Imagine trying to figure out who that someone is just from their footprints. The universe and science in general in some ways can present the same sort of dilemma, where you can suspect something exists based on your observations, but otherwise know very little else about it. Scientific and indeed cosmic footprints. Nowhere is this more prominent than in the question of dark matter. We see its gravitational effects, its footprint so to speak, and something must be there like the footprints in the snow, but we know almost nothing else about it. But we're starting to glean hints of just what dark matter is, or at least how it behaves, exploring the person behind the footprints so to speak. My guest today takes on that question, and her team has yielded observations of galaxies that reveal that dark matter may be far more complicated than anyone had previously suspected. Welcome to Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. joined by Shani Daniele, a physics PhD student at Yale University where she works with Professor Peter van Dockum and the Dragonfly team. Her research focuses on the formation and evolution of dwarf galaxies and ultra-diffuse galaxies. She uses observational tools such as a Dragonfly telephoto array, the Hubble Space Telescope and the Keck Telescope. Shani Daniele, welcome to the program. My pleasure. The story of dark matter, which has has always been, I suppose, one of the most mysterious things in science, but it's getting more complicated lately because of these diffuse galaxies you and your team are looking at. Now, what makes these galaxies special? Why are they different from, say, a spiral galaxy like the Milky Way? Back in 2015-16, we used this new innovative telescope called the Dragonfly Telephoto Array, And we looked at the well-studied coma cluster and found this new class of galaxies that we named ultra-diffuse galaxies. So these galaxies are pretty big galaxies. So they have uh, Milky Way-sized galaxies, but they're very, very diffuse. They have uh, between 100 to 1,000 less stars. So it makes them very faint, which is probably one of the reasons we haven't detected them so far. So basically, they have luminosities of dwarf galaxies, very low mass galaxies, but very, very big sizes. Another really interesting property is that uh, many of them, despite the fact that they are so faint, many of them have these compact sources that we recognize as star clusters, same star clusters that we observe in our own Milky Way. But the number of star clusters in these ultra-diffuse galaxies are much higher than we would expect, given the amount of light in this in these galaxies. So these are really uh, spectacular objects that we've never seen before. This combination of very diffuse light, the galaxy, and the large number of these star clusters that we sometimes also call them global clusters, was a completely new thing uh, that we have never seen before. Now, it, two of these galaxies, however, play into dark matter in one way. They 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 don't seem to have very much of it. What leads you to suspect that they don't? Yeah, that's right. So last year uh, in April, we published a new paper, new article in the Nature magazine about the first one, actually the first galaxy, NGC 1052 DF2. And we've measured the kinematics of this galaxy. So how stars basically move and in what velocities they move in the galaxy. And what we inferred is that their motion, the motion of the stars and their velocity is consistent with having no dark matter at all. So what we the, the velocities that we observe 
are consistent with the amount of mass that we infer only from the light that we can observe, the visible component of the galaxy. Now, you also have an example in these ultra-diffuse galaxies of the exact opposite, where you have one that over 99% of its mass appears to be dark matter. How, how do these two reconcile against each other? So that's actually another fascinating aspect. So that's right in 2006. Uh, so before this, this galaxy lacking dark matter, we actually first uh, measured the, the kinematics or the dynamics of another ultra-diffuse galaxy in the coma cluster. And this galaxy seemed to have more dark matter than, than we expected, given, given, given the, the mass of in stars for this galaxy. Now, these two galaxies, it's really a puzzle because they look very similar. They have this very diffuse, smooth component of light. And both of them are dotted with these globular clusters, with these very bright star clusters. But they live in very different environments. So the massive one lives in the coma cluster, which is a very massive cluster of galaxies. However, the galaxy lacking dark matter, the F2, lives actually in a smaller galaxy group that is composed only out of 20-something galaxies, and it's actually much closer to us. So they do live in different environments. And the fact that we found both of them about sort of at the same time might be related to the fact that we used it uh, for the first time a telescope that is actually sensitive to galaxies that are very, very faint, that their surface brightness is very, very low. So it might be a chance, but we cannot point out why we get different masses of these galaxies for, for these two galaxies. And this is something that we're definitely looking into by looking more of these galaxies, both in cluster environments, in group environments, but also galaxies that are isolated from other galaxies to understand maybe environment helped somehow to actually produce, you know, form these galaxies in the first place. Now, I'd read that it, it might be one possibility here is that galaxies may be able to siphon dark matter away from each other, I assume gravitationally. Is that is that a realistic possibility? So this is definitely one of the possible explanations that maybe at some, at some point this galaxy interacted with the massive galaxy in the, in this, in the very same group, NGC 1052, and dark matter was disrupted from DF2 and left it with no dark matter. However, if this is the case, and see it might be the case, we would expect to see some features of the light. So to see some signature to the fact that the two galaxies were interacting. And also the fact that we see so many of these star clusters, which should have been ripped from the galaxy as well, means that it had to, ha to have even more of these star clusters. And even now, the large number of star clusters in this galaxy is unique and, and an outlier on, on itself. So this is this is one possible explanation, but explanation. But in order to to actually you know lock our, ourselves on this explanation, we need to do some more more uh, theoretical work to simulate maybe you know the group environment and uh, and see if if it can indeed be the case. So we're not certain, but this is one of the possible explanations. At least, at least within the known framework of, you know, right. uh, cold, cold dark matter universe and galaxy formation theory. Now, do you have examples of these diffuse galaxies that appear normal as far as dark matters? Is there what you would expect from from a galaxy like this? Are there examples of that? Yeah, so, um, you know, up to now, there are only a handful of these galaxies that we've actually uh, measured their dynamics and, you know, actually got spectra because it's also a very expensive resource. But some of them, yes, some of them look like they are behaving uh, in a normal way and they have a pretty normal dark matter component. Some of them also don't have these star clusters that I, I was talking about. So it's definitely, we are starting to think that it's definitely a mixed bag of objects. And, you know, these two properties of the lack of dark matter and this population of intriguing uh, global clusters may or may not be related to each other. But we're definitely looking here at different type of objects that might have had different uh, formation scenarios. So these star clusters appear to be related in some way to this. Is how would is there any ideas on how you know a, a lack of dark matter would correlate with a large amount of star clusters? So it's quite funny because so far in the universe, if you take all of the studies that 
looked at some correlation between number of globular clusters and, and dark matter mass, studies actually found the opposite. They found that the number of, of these star clusters correlates with dark matter, such that if you have more star clusters, you expect to have more massive dark matter halos. So the fact that we actually find a lot of these global clusters and not a lot of dark matter, if at all, is actually really intri- intriguing and interesting. Specifically in this, uh, in this new galaxy, DF2, we find that these global clusters are also brighter than what we would expect global clusters to be. So they are brighter than uh, Milky Way global clusters. So that's, that's another uh, aspect that we, we published another paper on that we can't quite uh, understand so far. But, but we think that the two properties might be related to each other, but it's still, it's still early to um, conclude that for sure. That's interesting. What, what could make a star cluster in a diffuse galaxy brighter than what you would find in the Milky Way? Maybe stellar types or something like that? Or is there any ideas on what might be causing that? So the, the stellar populations in, in these uh, star clusters are pretty normal. So they, what we would expect from star clusters, they are pretty old uh, and metal poor. So, so th- they are not unique in that sense. But, you know, maybe in this galaxy, there was some sort of extreme condition that, that basically formed this uh, super bright, more massive, and, and even actually bigger in, in size than the Milky Way global clusters uh, that is also related to the lack of dark matter. So maybe there were, for example, very, very dense regions with, with a lot of gas that both created this baryonic galaxy that is composed of, uh, only out of baryonic matter, normal matter, and these uh, very, very, uh, you know, dense star clusters because you need to have very dense regions of gas to actually create these very compact star clusters. So this, this might be related to each other, but at this point, it's, we really don't know. It's all very new. Now, how might this affect the current hypothetical explanations for dark matter, such as the weakly interacting particles? Does this change the game for those types of explanations, or does it strengthen them? What effect uh, does this discovery have on that? It's kind of funny because, uh, ironically, it actually uh, helps, in general, dark matter theory. Because for the first time, it shows that dark matter and, and normal baryonic matter are actually separable from each other. So, so far, every galaxy that we observed, we really needed this component of dark matter to explain the, the motion of the stars in the galaxy. But there are, of course, other theories that provide uh, a different explanation for, for the, the, the dynamics of, of galaxies, saying that maybe on these scales, there are some alternative theories for gravity that are not quite uh, what we uh, what we know on other scales. So the fact that we find a galaxy that doesn't need this explanation and can only be explained by the normal matter actually helps dark matter theory. It shows that it provides evidence that dark matter is real. Now, oh, absolutely. Um, now, <laughs> in a, a in a context of a more normal galaxy, like a larger galaxy, like to say the Milky Way. You don't see this effect, though, do you? You see, you don't see differences in what you would expect to find as far as dark matter versus what's actually there. You're only seeing it just in this one narrow class of galaxies, right? So far, that's right. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So far, in in all uh, what you called, you know, larger galaxies, spiral galaxies, uh, Milky Way type uh, observations were pretty consistent in terms of. The amount of normal matter that we observe just from light and the amount of dark matter that we infer from kinematics, from the kinematics of, of these galaxies, this relation has been observed to be pretty tight. And basically every galaxy that we've observed so far had dark matter in it. So uh, up until this point, so this is this is something right. completely new. But that we also hadn't looked, as you said, hadn't seen these types of galaxies before either. Do you anticipate that there could be other types of galaxies out there that might have varying uh, dark matter? I mean, do you expect to find anything else or would that be a complete surprise? Yeah, so the fun thing is that actually in November last year, uh, we found a second galaxy that has very little to no dark matter. 
at the same, at the very same group, at the same group, NGC 1052. This one is the second one is called DF4. So it's another galaxy that we cataloged from the same observations. So this is a second galaxy uh, that looks very similar um, to the first one, to DF2. It, it lives in the same group and it has very similar properties. So again, this diffuse smooth light, these uh, very uh, compact star clusters, and again, like in dark matter, in the very same group. Uh, we are right now looking uh, wider. So we are working, uh, we actually just finished observing a very wide uh, blank area with the same, with, with Dragonfly, the same telescope that is very, sensitive for faint phenomena in the universe and we are planning to go over and try to find more candidates of these ultra diffuse galaxies and go back to the telescope in Hawaii, the Keck telescope, and use several instruments to uh, follow up these galaxies and, and learn about their dark matter halos. If, if you ask my opinion, I believe we'll find more of these galaxies. And I, I believe that we'll find actually a wide uh, range of, of properties, but hopefully it will take us one step closer to understand how, how these galaxies were formed. And one step closer to understanding dark matter itself. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Which has been rather maddening. I, you know, we still don't know very much about this stuff at all. And it's interesting to yep. see developments. Yeah. All right, well, thank you for appearing with us. And I wish you great luck in your research. And at some point, if you'd like to come back for another discovery, I'll watch the papers. I would love to. Thank you, John. One could make the case that dark matter is, at least currently, the most mysterious phenomenon in the universe. And one could further make another case that as we begin to understand it, it's only going to get even more mysterious. Why does a certain class of galaxies seem to have almost no dark matter? What makes those galaxies different from, say, the Milky Way, which seems loaded with dark matter? What does this mean for our understanding, or lack thereof, of dark matter as a whole? We don't yet know, and I find that exciting. All we can do is wait and see what the scientists discover. Speaking of discoveries, John. Well, more accurately, discovery. Our producer, Ross Campbell, is working on a discovery of his own. What are you alluding to this time, Anna? I need exactly 21 days before I'm allowed to inform you. You know what? I'm going to commit this time. In exactly 21 days, I'm going to get the answer out of you. None of your shenanigans this time. And on that note, joining me next week will be astronomer Christian Reddy of Launchpad Astronomy here on YouTube for a discussion of all things astronomy and the far future of the universe. See you then.